Hello everyone, this is Latia for you. I'm coming again today with another Bible study video. All right, let's go ahead and pray and get started. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for your beauty, your grace. I thank you that you are omnipotent and you're all-knowing and you're all-seeing. You're not a man that you should lie, neither are you the son of man that you should repent. You are clothed in the clouds. You are shrouded in glory, God. You are a mighty God. We are so glad that our God is a good God. He, he doesn't want harm for us. He doesn't want evil for us. He doesn't want bad things for us, but he wants to bless us and keep us. So we trust in your word. These are the things that your word says for our God. So we trust in it. We accept your proposal of love. We accept your proposal of marriage. We give you all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for pouring out your blood for us, Jesus. Bless this word, God, all of you and none of me. Let your Holy Spirit feel free to work. Pour out your love, God. Bless the people who are listening. Be a shield of protection around them. Make your hand to just be over their finances, their, their life, their ministries. And as they go out into this world and spread your gospel, God, be with them. Give them the words to say. We love you, Lord. All of my mistakes, Lord God, be in all of it. All of you and none of me in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are coming from the book of Corinthians today. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 through 8. I actually had to ask God a couple of times, are you sure is this what you're saying? Or am I getting this wrong? Is it 1 Corinthians? When? No, he said 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 through 8. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, verse 2 says, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad? but the one who is made sorrowful by me. Okay, so we're gonna just stop right there and then we'll, we'll keep going. So this is from 2 Corinthians and in this epistle of Paul, so he's writing to the Corinthians, basically about letting them know that he wasn't gonna be able to make it this time around, that he, he was gonna have to skip is coming there and it was for it feels like multiple reasons but the main one also was that he was offended by someone um there and it doesn't come out until like around chapter two it seems like but something happened and I don't think this is the Marcus incident the incident I think his name was Marcus where he kind of abandoned ship with Paul I don't think this is that person I think this is something else and I'm just so glad that God included things like this in the Bible because it lets us know that these are humans we are human beings God is not afraid of us as humans He's not afraid of our situations. He's not intimidated by the fact that we go through ups and downs, that we can be very emotional sometimes, that we can be influenced by outside factors, spiritual factors. He went through it too. Jesus went through these things as well. He knows what kind of trials we go through. He is not unfamiliar with it. Why? Because he came down. He clothed himself in human flesh and did not see it as beneath him. He decided to go through with that. To become this perfect man, this one new man, this perfect sacrifice for both Jews and Gentiles. So we can look at him as the example and say, hey, this thing can be lived out. It can be done. It says, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad? but the one who is made sorrowful by me. So he's acknowledging, Paul here, is acknowledging the interplay of Christians, of, of 
fellow believers, of brothers and sisters in Christ. We have like this cyclical conjoined relationship where we are a part of this body, right? And we should be building each other up and encouraging each other with words of encouragement. Yes, we go through problems. We have issues. Sometimes people fall out. But that doesn't mean that we should divorce ourselves from the body, divorce ourselves from church or fellowship. If anything, this should be a time of example where we come out and we show what it truly means to follow Christ. It means that we're supposed to get up and dust ourselves off, dust our offense off, you know, don't go praying and oh Lord, and this and that, and and you have not, you know, really addressed anything with your brother and sister, don't go asking God for stuff, and you know you've offended somebody, or that they have offended you, go to God in prayer and ask him how to address the situation, but don't go to God in prayer asking for something on, on a whole nother note, or asking him to, to stretch, you know, like strike them down, that's not, the way we deal with things as Christians, as as fellow believers, as heirs of Christ. We are supposed to back away from the situation. We're supposed to be wise and gracious, right? We're supposed to be leaving people with gifts of love and intentional about our words to them. I want to say That's in Ephesians, one of the chapters that we study. When we leave them, we shouldn't be um, feeling that we've taken something away. We should be leaving something. So we should be very careful in how we speak, right? Either that's Ephesians or when we were in Thessalonians. But either way, we're not supposed to be taking and, and leaving people feeling less than. We should be building them up. Not to say that there's never a time for rebuke, right? There is a time for rebuke. There is a time for correction. But in this cycle, who's going to build you up if you're putting everybody down, if you're just in a, in a, a mode of rebuke? What hell do you have to put someone in? You're not God. When the Lord tells you to say something, that's one thing. But when you're just right and you know you're right and you need to tell people, and you need to, you know, get it off your chest. No, that's not how we are led. We are led by the spirit. The power of the spirit lets us know, hey, keep your mouth shut here. Go over here, speak, say this, don't say that, right? And when we're walking in that, we should be building people up more than tearing people down. God's vengeance only, God's anger only lasts for a moment. So that's how we should be. It should not be a sense of, oh, you're 90% mad and 10%, you know, oh, hallelujah. No, that's not the way we live, right? We live on a cloud with Jesus ruling from heavenly places. So don't let someone bring you down because they offended you. Yes, it's okay to feel that offense. It's okay to feel some kind of way, yeah. But take that to God in prayer and ask God to help your feelings of offendedness. Help him to take it away and to bandage any hurt that's there and ask him how to address this with your brother or sister. And that's how we should see it as a brother or a sister. A a perfect example is um, at one point I had met someone and um, upon meeting them, I was going through something. I, I was rushing. I had my girls. Um, I was by myself. I was late (laughs) and I had walked in and I was just so flustered. And like the people that were standing at the door, um, they, one of the persons opened the door. And so I was just like, I'm sorry, I'm so late or something like that. I said, but the person said something that was offensive to me. And this person was completely right. They were like, oh, you shouldn't say such and such. You should say such and such. You are da, 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 da. But the way that it was kind of barked at me, I was like kind of offended. And immediately, and that's why you have to have the Holy Spirit to tell you when to speak and when not to speak. 
Um, and that's for both of us, me and the other believer. Um, that person I, I said that to me and I was offended. And immediately I knew the enemy had entered in. And I knew that he had like tried to take a peg, you know, tried to, to knock me down even further while I was down, you know? So I felt slightly offended by that person and turned off by that person. And every time I saw that person, I remembered that interaction because that was my first interaction with that person. So, and I know the devil was happy that day, right? Because I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, don't be offended by that person. Do not be offended by that person. And I knew by the way that he was telling me this is that he wanted me to know that person. And that was a plan of the enemy to do it that way because he didn't want our interaction to grow. He didn't want our relationship to grow. So he knows that there's some sort of connection there. And this, this interaction happened hmm, maybe about five months ago, right? And so time went on and I would try, you know, and ask God, Lord, help me not to be angry at that person. Help me not to be offended by that person. Lord, every time I see that person, let me not feel that way. And Lord, help that person to grow because I didn't know that person well enough to go and try to correct them. I'm not, that's not my job. I just prayed, Lord, you show them the better way, right? So, because I, I knew that it wasn't my place and this is an elder to me. So I was just, you know, living out my Christian walk and doing the best I could and, you know, going about my business and asking God to forgive me for my offense if it was causing me to, you know, act any way, Lord, show me how to do better. And so um, anyway, at one point, this person was preaching and I had never heard this person preach. But when this person stood up and preached, it was not a stumbling block to me like the enemy wanted it to be, like to where I don't want to receive. You know how sometimes when you don't want to receive from a person who's offended you. And so when this person stood up and began to preach, their spirit was testifying to my spirit. I don't know if you've ever felt that where you know this person has the Holy Spirit. You know this person is sent by God. You know this person has some sort of connection with your spirit. The moment she began to preach, I knew it rang true in me that the Lord wanted me to know that person because their calling was similar to mine. And it, it just took me on like a, a, a high in the Lord because it was like, this is why you didn't want me to be offended. This is why you don't like us to allow these interactions to stop us from growing in our relationships. He wants us to be friends. He wants us to be interconnected and he doesn't want our humanity to get in the way of our development in him, right? So you must continue to grow. You must continue to interact because who's going to encourage you if you've offended the one who should be the encourager to you, right? This is a cycle and you have to allow God to grow you beyond what you already know and also beyond your mind because I can, I can go along and I can say, hey, you know, Lord, God, I, I, help me, help me to not be offended. Help me to forgive this person. But you have to know that that is with my mind in my mouth. It's going to take some spiritual deliverance. It's going to take a moment of me saying, hey, okay, God, I don't know how to get past this. Please, you do it. I surrender this to you. It's, a, it's almost like a heart surrender and a God surrendering moment where you may not know how to exactly get out of this and get over the offense, but God knows. He sees. I'm sorry, I kind of got off on a tangent, but you know, our testimony, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So, um, we'll just reread verse two. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who is made sorrowful by me? Verse three. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that make that my joy is the joy of you all. This is King 
the new King James Version, if anyone wants to know. And I wrote this very thing to you, verse three again, and I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. So here, Paul is basically explaining that, hey, I don't want to come and be uncomfortable. I don't want to come and you be uncomfortable. Let's put it all out there on the table. Let's be clear. I want to say in um, chapter one of this book, he basically explains that same thing. I'm not twisting words. I'm not um, hiding anything. This is what it is. I don't want to be sorrowful over that interaction I don't want to be angry and you, that that's a part of spiritual maturity of growing in the body of Christ is knowing when you should go and knowing when you should hold back knowing when you should speak a word and knowing when you shouldn't right because we know our flesh we know when the enemy wants to take over or when he has stepped in and we we're not ready right now something's wrong right even if you have to take just even a moment and you don't have time to say, okay, well, I can't do it right now, but all you have is a very millisecond. You can consult the Lord in that little moment and God can bring deliverance if he knows you have to do something and you have to interact. So just taking that moment and saying, God, I am offended and I don't know what to do. I bring this to you. I bring this to you. I surrender it to you. Fix this. And then you go about your, 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 whatever you have to do, right? Because sometimes we can't back out. Sometimes we have to go forward and do what we're supposed to do. But either way, here, Paul is just being honest. I wrote to you this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over, over those from whom I ought to have joy, right? Because like, if he would have come, who knows, someone else might have picking up the defense of that person and said, oh, I'm sorry for such as I did, but you know, he da 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 da, da this and that, and you shouldn't be offended. Da, da. No, no. He knew it was not the right timing for him to go. He knew that, that there might be some, mm, he knew he needed to get over it. Just like, um, I've used this as an example before, but Aaron, when he was about to go offer uh, sacrifices and do things for the Lord. And yet he, his sons had been killed for, um, a violation, right? So as priests, they had violated God's word. They had violated the law. I want to say they, it's, it's not really clear what his sons had done, but, um, I want to say that they offered incense improperly and maybe they were drunk as well. That's the suspicion. I want to say I, I've researched this previously what they had done but um it's it's suspected that they had been drunk or drinking the wine or something that is in the temple or and they offered incense there was some offense there was something that happened and of course as priests they were not allowed to do that and they were not allowed to offer incense they were not allowed to do something whatever it was they were not allowed to do it and they did it and they were killed in the presence of God, God smote them, God killed them. Fire, I want to say, came out and killed them. So Aaron was saddened and hurt and offended. And I don't, I don't necessarily know that he was offended, but he knew that he could not enter into God's presence at that point. He knew that he could not go offer sacrifices. He knew that, yes, he had a duty, but he had to back up for a second. It's good to know when you need to sit down. It's good to know when you don't need to move forward. I think people are so scared of those words because they're, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not in a position where I need to go sit in, you know. No, sometimes you don't need to be sat down, but you need to sit down. You need to sit yourself down, right? Know when you've been offended. It's a part of your maturity and growing in the body. He says, I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. Having confidence in you, all that my joy is the joy of you all. Remember, Paul, when he's writing all of these letters in the New Testament, he feels that these are his children, right? Like Thessalonians. We talked about this. These are his, these are people that he've held close to him, that he've held to his breast, basically like God holds his, us as his children. 
he feels the same way because these are seeds that he planted and he's cultivated and they are his crown. He's, he said that he, he feels that they are his, his glory. He's so happy to bring glory to God because he has done something for the Lord. And he, he loves these people. He knows that he's a human. He knows that, you know, he's in a position of authority. He's like a father figure to them, right? I'm sorry, my dog is barking in the back. But he's like a father figure to these people. And, you know, when he's offended by them, and it happens, right? We're dealing with a missionary. So what a missionary usually is a person who who might need, you know, some sponsorship, who, you know, even if you don't ask outright, or you do ask outright, or you're sending other missionaries out to go plant seeds in other cities, and which city is the most important city, and where should we send the next person, and I don't believe that we should, there are lots of conflicts, there's humanity involved here, so people get offended, people abandon ship, people come on, right, and if you're not operating in the Holy Spirit, people get burned out easily, right? So it's important to remember that you are dealing with humans. You are human. And you have to know when you have been offended, when you should step back, and when you should allow God to just move on this situation and move on your heart so that this offense is not a stumbling block to you. Verse four, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Wow. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved but that you might think that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you for out of my affliction. So that means that he was going through things on his own, most likely too, not just this offense. He, you know, Paul was in and out of jail. He was being beaten. He, he was brave enough to stand in front of philosophers and debate their religions and, and, and talk about who God was, I don't know if it was necessarily a debate, but he would, he would propose, you know, that, that the God of the universe is the one true and living God, right? So he, he was going through stuff. He would be under house arrest. He would be beaten. He would be jailed, right? And then he had also internal offenses from within the church, but that didn't stop him from going forward. It may have stopped him from going to a city like this one, Corinth at the time, but he, it didn't mean that he was forever not going to come. If the Lord was willing, he would do it in the future, but he needed to let that offense ease over and pass so that when he went back, there was love and there was joy, not anguish of heart, not tears and grief. Right. He said, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Hmm. He was trying to write out of a place of love, even though there had been offense and rightfully so, maybe, you know how, you know, you're right. And yet God still is like, so be quiet. I need you to be quiet right now. You might be right, but be wrong for the Lord. I, I want to say I heard someone say that before. Be wrong for God. You need to be willing to be wrong. Just even if you're right, just for the Lord. Just be wrong in that moment. Just sip the lips. <laughs> As my mom used to say, sip your lips. <laughs> and you know, we're so quick to, to I guess the, the new term would be clap back and say something back to people, right? Just because you are right, maybe. But don't be a, a stumbling block for someone else. Don't cause offense in someone else. Be bigger than that. Persevere, as Revelation says. Rise above. 
rise above your circumstance. That's Revelation 3, right? You want to be the, the church of Philadelphia. You want to have had works, a little strength, kept the word, not denied him or his name. That's what perseverance does. When you've risen above your situation, risen above that offense and said, hey, you know what? God is bigger. God is greater than this. I feel that offense, but God is greater. And he does not want me to make this a stumbling block. One time, and I'm just going to be really quick, you know, sometimes um, offenses or, or things can actually happen between God and man people, us. God is not afraid of that, of offending us. He's not afraid of us even bringing our offense to him, right? So because we are covered by the blood of Christ, we can still enter his presence and talk to him about it. Unlike Aaron, who did not want to go in God's presence, right? Offended and offering offerings, right? Knowing what he was feeling in his heart, because he know he could be struck down. So for us personally, we can't actually go before God with our offenses and talk to him about it, right? So one time I was offended <laughs> by God. I was trusting in God and trusting in God for um, an MCAT score. I'm just going to be honest and tell you guys. <laughs> I was trusting in God for this specific number. And I was just so, I, when I tell you I had written every Bible verse <laughs> in my journal and you know when I didn't get that number I was so offended <laughs> I had done named it and claimed it I was so offended by God I was like Lord really you're gonna do this to me and you know how hard I've studied how deeply I went into this and you know I was just and I'm talking about deep in the word and deep in my books like I was I was on it with it. And I was just so trusting him for this number. And God was trying to show me, of course, that he could do what he wanted to do without a number. That's not, that wasn't the point. So I actually chose to be offended in that moment. I could feel it in my heart. Like I knew in my spirit that when I was doing it, I was choosing to be offended. But I did not know of the implications of what I was doing. So I was, I basically had made a choice that, well, for now, I'm going to be offended. I choose to be offended. I choose to kind of walk this out for a little while, and then I'll come back to the Lord because I know I love him. I just, you know, I'm offended right now. So, but the way that I had done it had been such a turn from the Lord. It was like a seed that was planted. And I think it wasn't just the seed of offense. It was the blatant nature with which I did it. I knew that I was doing it and I felt that I had a right to, but I knew that it was wrong. So the way that I was doing it. And so, of course, I wasn't away from God long, but when I came back, I felt like something was different. I felt like there was a part of me that was different. And I didn't know how to get it back. And when I tell you guys, I took, it took so long before I felt fully restored and I'm sure God had already fully restored me but he knew that my heart choice had made a difference in my spirit and it had grieved the Holy Spirit in some way and so that I didn't trust him with this situation and that I chose offense rather than choosing love and acceptance and knowing that he could do it right so and I feel like I really slowed down the process of things and I kind of kind of threw a, a, what do you call it, something in the workings, in the cranks to slow everything down. So just know that it's okay to be offended or, or saddened by a situation, but bring those things before him and do not let them take root in your heart. Do not have evil or bitterness in your heart because bitterness can take root, right? Even if you're not intending it to go there. It can, it's like leaven, right? Leaven, you don't need much yeast. You don't need that much. All you need is a small, tiny, tiny amount. And that can spread 
especially when there is intentionality in, involved in your heart, knowing what you are doing, presumptive sin, right? Knowing that you're gonna come back and ask for forgiveness, but for right now, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. So it says, verse four, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love with which I have so abundantly for you. He had love. We, we were saying that in Thessalonians because he truly loved the Thessalonians. You could tell in his, his demeanor, he loved them, right? He was very happy to be a part of their, of their um, basically their administration, their patriarchy. He was glad that they were a church plant because they were so faithful, right? So here we kept saying that they, he got love, he got love for them, right? So he had love for the, the M2 Corinthians, but he, it, when he's writing this letter, he said it was out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears. It's okay to feel these emotions, feel them, feel it, cry. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be, have anguish of heart. It's okay to be grieved, but don't be deceived by the enemy. Know that it should be out of love and the abundance of love for them. Don't cry and grieve out of offense and say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to be offended and I'm falling out with the church. That's what the devil wants. The devil loves it when you fall out with your church. And that, that is a trick of the enemy that he has, he has been working that, working that since the beginning of the church. We, we, we think that in the 20th century, we've invented church hurt. No, that's been here since the beginning and people falling out with God because they've fallen out with their church. That is not the way we are to be. First of all, we are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. We are the ones who are supposed to be going out into the world, right? So it's not a building. It's not, it's not a physical structure. It is the body that we work with, right? So you don't be offended by the body, right? We need each other. We need the love. We need the interconnectedness. Yes, you may have affliction. You may have anguish of heart. You may have many tears. You may be grieved, but do it out of love. Love. I work for God out of the love. My love for him and my love for his people. Thank you, Lord. Keep me there. Verse five, but if anyone causes grief, he has not grieved me but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. The punishment which has inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So he's saying that if anyone has caused grief, like basically the whole body will, would, would be receiving a punishment, right? If, if he had grieved him. If anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent. Why? Because that person came from out of you guys. That was a reflection of what was going on in the body, in the church, this offense, whatever it was that, that happened. Maybe, maybe it was something that was deeper in the church. You don't want people going out into the world saying, oh, I go to such and such church now. You need it. Da, 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 da. That's a poor reflection of your church, of the body. He said, but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. And like, I'm not trying to be funny, but that's y'all's church. We should be building each other up in that church. Something has gone wrong over here. Either he's not receiving the proper word. He's not receiving the proper maturity. He's not receiving the proper nourishment or something. That's a reflection of the body that you're surrounding yourself with. Right? So he's saying, yes, if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. He's not trying to be funny here. He's not trying to be harsh toward them, but he's saying it's basically a reflection of you, 
uh, it's a reflection of what whatever is going on there, right? So when people are in our church and they're showing out in public or, or we see our young people acting a certain way, doing a certain thing, and we don't, we don't admonish or, or speak to them or try to, to show some sort of love and correction or go to someone who can, and we just allow it to be, hey, this is not the, this is not, this not a reflection on God. This is not a reflection on that visiting pastor. This is a reflection on you and what kind of body we're connected with. Who are you supposed to be mentoring? Who are you supposed to be building up in Christ? We all should be teaching someone. If we're studying the word of God, it says that at some point we should be teachers. And I'm not exempt from this. I just started these Bible studies. I'm, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. But thank you, Lord, for graduating me from, from milk to meat. At some point, we should all be mentoring. I think, and I've said this, I want to say in another teaching once before, don't be so quick to tell people, oh, you preaching now. Don't talk to people like that. First of all, we all should be teaching the word of God. If you are a disciple of Christ and you are following him, then the Holy Spirit will lead you to mentorship. But if you're doing your own thing, then you'll be talking about, oh, you're a preacher. You thank you. Uh -uh. No, that's not the way. That's not that's not building up in the body. That's jealousy. That's hateration. That's that's all from the enemy. And the fact that you would say that is a reflection of where you're coming from. I'm, I'm sorry if I've caused offense, but not to be too severe, as verse five says. <laughs> verse six, this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. When you, when you are at, as a church or a body say, hey, that doesn't represent us, or you go into a corrective mode and do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do with this person, sat that person, sit that person down, or or give them some counseling, or let them know that, hey, this is not approved of. This is not represent us. When you do that, that is correction enough. He's saying the punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. That disapproval from the majority, from those who are fellow believers, those who are trying to walk circumspectly, that is in itself a, a enough of a punishment. Verse seven, so that on the contrary, on the contrary, on the other side of it, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him. So basically now, now that he has, he has felt this wrath, he has felt this sadness and this grief, and he knows that he was wrong, now comfort him, restore that person, love on that person. Why? You don't want that to be a stumbling block for them and have them fall out over it, right? We are a body, we are brothers and sisters. So any type of disapproval you show, it needs to come from love. Just like he said earlier, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. He had anguish, he had affliction of heart, he had tears and grief, but where did it come from? Love. So when you are correcting someone or you are, are going about trying to restore something, make sure that you have consulted the Holy Spirit. And if you're a person who knows that you can't hear properly, then you need to allow someone else to do that, someone who can. Or you need to make sure you are learning how to properly walk in the spirit, right? And then from there, you know, maybe an elder, maybe someone else to go with you, but make sure it's done out of love. That is the key, right? So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive. You should be forgiving and comforting him, that person who has done the offense. So comfort and forgiveness, that's how you come out of love from a person who has offended you. 
or who has offended someone else and you're letting them know that this is not the right way. Comfort and forgiveness. What are those two things? Those are birthed out of love right? Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. You don't want that person to be so grieved that they're consumed and it is a stumbling block for them and they can't be restored, right? You want them to be restored. You want them to feel the love of Christ, even in their pain of the fact that they have been wrong, the fact that they've done something wrong. Hallelujah. God is trying to show us a better way. God is trying to show us that even in our wrongness, he's covered us with his blood. He's covered us with his love. I heard Brother Beecher say today, uh, Minister Beecher on YouTube say um, that when a a back in the Jewish tradition of Bible days, a man would uh, have a glass of wine and the wine was symbolic of blood. And so whenever he would pr propose to a, a Jewish maiden, he would go out into the square where everyone was and where the woman was, and he would hand the glass of wine to her or the glass of blood. And so either she would accept it or she would reject it. Maybe she might toss it, or, but if she accepted it, she would drink it and that it was a yes to the proposal. Jesus has proposed his love to us in his death. Jesus has proposed his love to us. We are to drink of his blood. We are to, to live this life. We have said yes to him. He's covering us with his blood. So we should be trying to cover others, right? With forgiveness and comfort, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. No, you are to get up, kick the dust off your feet and keep going. That's probably not a good analogy to kick the dust off your feet that has to do with spreading the gospel. But anyway, you know what I mean. Brush yourself off and get up and keep going. Everyone falls short of the mark. No one is perfect. Only Jesus was. But that's why the blood is so important. Verse eight, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Make sure you let people who've been offended know or who have done an offense know that you love them. Affirm them, comfort them. Forgive them. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. How do you reaffirm your love for someone? You make sure that you contact them. You make sure that you sit next to them in church. <laughs> you guys go to church together. You go out to lunch together. Let's go out. Let's do something. Let's come on. Let's go to Bible study. Are you going today? I just wanted to find out, you know, I love you. I, I don't want this, you know, situation. Don't be afraid to address the situation, but don't keep bringing it up all over and over again, right? Know the difference between the two. Let the Holy Spirit show you the difference. So, you know, go out of your way to reaffirm your love for someone, for that person who has offended others, for that person who's been corrected, for that person who's had to sit down. You don't want them to be swallowed up in too much sorrow, right? All right, you guys, this is the end of the teaching for today. God is so amazing. I love you, Lord. I thank you for my new microphone, Lord. And I thank you, say thanks to my husband for buying it for me. And I hope you all have a wonderful and blessed day today. And just know that Christ is so near. He's trying to mature us as much as he can before he comes. He's addressing his bride issues that he sees in his bride. That's why he's giving us these teachings. He wants us to be walking in maturity and pre preparing ourselves for our wedding right? So that when he, he washes us with his word, that we will be clean, that we will be sanctified and holy and without a spot or wrinkle on our gowns. 
Lord God, let us be made worthy. We know that your blood will cover us on that day. You are holy. You are sweet. You are good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to receive Christ into your heart, just repeat after me, Father God, in the name of Jesus. I know that my words are not sufficient. But Lord God, let my heart show that I love you and that I want to receive you into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Walk with me, abide in me. Pour your love into me. I know that you died on the cross and I ask you to move into my heart. Lead me and guide me every day. I believe that you rose from the dead and that was a a purchase of, of my soul, Lord God. You have forgiven me of my sins. Forgive me, Lord God. Forgive me, Jesus. Help me to walk in you, live in you, abide in you. I make you my Lord and Savior. Help me to walk it out in love on you. I know that this is a free gift that you gave me in your death. You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah, God. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name, you are my Lord. Amen. All right. If you've prayed that prayer, you need to go and, and go to the Lord in prayer. Talk to him. Ask him to pour his spirit out on you. Pour his Holy Spirit into you and and help you to walk and follow and abide in him. And then you also need to go and find a church home and somewhere where it teaches the word of God holy, like make sure that it's it's a, a place that the Holy Spirit has sent you, right? And sit under those teachings, get baptized, right? In the name of Jesus, be baptized and God will lead you and guide you in all truth. His Holy Spirit will lead you and bless your life. I bless you and I say, I love you all. Be blessed and have a great day. All right, take care.